contaminants in this water than what you're being told about. Scott was uh, brought on as our chief scientist. Bathroom, shower, air testing underway. Flint water crisis. This certified lab I use is really where the science is. These folks are dangerous. I do not trust any of them. This defines a dark age. We live in a dark age. It's defined by not knowing who you can trust in a society that runs on trust. I'm not going to allow anybody to spin this against me ever again. Good afternoon and welcome back to My Harlem Portraits, the show that wants to shed a light on the fundamental contribution of African Americans to the building of this country and to Black excellence and what is going on in this country. Today we are talking about a very important, very serious and very distressful subject, the Flint disaster. And this is a film Flint disaster thing, which was just released on April 29, the same week of the fatal water switch from the lake to the river that happened eight years ago. To talk about this, we have two very, very, very special guests. Dr. Karen Weaver, former Flint major, mayor, sorry, and PhD in child and family clinical psychology, with a specialization in pedi pediatric psychology. Sorry, my tongue is. Mm. <laughs> and Anthony Baxter, the director, a BAFTA award winning British filmmaker and journalist. He has done You Have Been Trumped and You've Been Trumped Too. Okay, among other things. So thank you and welcome to my Harlem portraits. Thank you for having us. Thank you. That's right. I saw this movie and I think it was incredible. And uh, I think it's a very stunning documentary that you've start, you started over five years ago to expose probably one of the worst man-made poisoning that has happened in the American history. And uh, I would like to ask you, Anthony, what made you embark in this? And Dr. Weaver, you served as the first female mayor of Flint from 2015 to 2019, which makes it right in the midst of all the happenings. And you were the second vice president of the African American Mayors Association and on the advisory board of the US Conference of Mayors. Yes. What made you, uh, 
get in contact and get in touch with uh, Anthony and support the making of this movie and be part of it the way you were? You know, that, that's an interesting, uh, that's a good question, really, because I think Anthony talked with me, but he was always there. You know, he was always in Flint. And I didn't know who he was at first. I knew he was there. I knew he was part of the media. I knew he was doing something. But he, you know, I thought, I didn't even know you came from someplace else at that point, because he was always there when things were happening. And I'd see him. And, and it was funny, because even when I watched the documentary, I said, that there he was. And, and I just remember you being there from the very beginning. He was <laughs> documenting things. So I was glad when, when uh, he reached out again and said, here's what we're doing, because I didn't even know that is what was taking place at the time. You didn't know that. I didn't know that. Adop no, I did not know that he was working on a, on a film about this okay. at all. I just saw him as one of the as one of the news media that was there. But I knew he mm -hmm. was always there. Yeah. And, and, you know, he stands out because he's tall. So I would remember, <laughs> really, you know, I'm like, there's that guy. I don't know who he is, uh, you know, and, and, and he was just there. He was there and he was, you know, asking tough questions. I remember that. So that's why I said I was I was glad when I found out what was going on because I knew that what was going on in Flint is something that should be documented for mm -hmm. others to see. Exactly. And what made you, Anthony, do that? Well, I was in Detroit. I'd just shown a previous film I'd made called The Dangerous Game, which was a follow-up to You've Been Trumped. And it's about big money golf courses around the world and luxury resorts and the consumption of water in part. And so I was at a screening where somebody from Flint came up to me afterwards and said, you should come through to Flint because we've got problems with our water ongoing at the moment. And this was before it became a big news story. This was before the residents conducted the citizen science testing and brought in Professor Mark Edwards to oversee that. So it was early in 2015. And when I went through to Flint, I was appalled to find what I found. I mean, it was basically the same I've seen in other films I've made, where people are very aware of something really wrong and going to people in power and basically being told you're Nothing making wrong. this up. And it, yeah, exactly. And so it was <clears throat> it was really distressing to see that. And then the residents started their big citizen science test overseen by Professor Edwards. And then Dr. Mona Hanna Ratisha, a local pediatrician, made the link between the switch from the Great Lakes mm -hmm. to the Flint River and how that switch in the aftermath of that had impacted directly on the health of children in Flint mm -hmm. and their lead levels had gone up. And that was when it became a very big news story. And but I then stayed with it for five years. As uh, Karen said, I was here a lot and actually in the same hotel I'm talking to you from in Flint today. Um, and I stayed with it when the cameras had left because I felt that that was when, in many ways, the people had been left. Um, I mean, Karen was um, became mayor of the city uh, and did, uh, I think, yeah, credible work um, <clears throat> at trying to nice. rebuild not only the trust in it that had been shattered by uh, the, the, the previous uh, mayor, really, by who went on television to tell everybody the water's perfectly safe uh, when it wasn't, uh, but also overseeing and, and doing what she could do. But there was no federal money. I mean, there was no big cash coming into Flint from the government to rip up the pipes and start again and to try and rebuild that trust. And that's what I wanted to ask uh, uh, Karen to start with, because I saw that one of the first thing that you did, first of all, you came in when all this mess had happened. So you found yourself in the middle of it without, did you know at the time yet or not? 
when you, you know what, when I first started campaigning for mayor, when I was running, that was not our issue. Originally, it was the cost of water. We had been taken over by the state as far as our government. Mm -hmm. And so it was the cost. We were paying eight times the national average. Wow. And then the water got switched. And immediately, you know, in Flint, we knew there was a problem because the water changed colors. Uh, it, it, it didn't smell right. People started having skin problems and hair problems. And so we knew immediately, but it had really been covered up for almost 18 months uh, before everyone else found out. So before I got elected, I did real, you know, know that there was a problem because I was one of those people that also got a call from Virginia Tech. Uh, uh, because I wanted to get my water tested. And they called me, you know, 10 o'clock on a Sunday night. You know, I said, this must be important. They're calling on Sunday night at 10 p.m. saying, uh, you know, your, your water has tested high for lead levels. And they advised me to not cook with it, don't brush my teeth with it. So I thought, oh, wow. And as a, as a psychologist, you know, I knew I had an ethical responsibility to speak up. And I remember having a press conference and I said, I'm not doing this as a candidate for mayor. I'm doing it because I am a psychologist and I do realize the impact. And, and it was just interesting because there were many people that said I was politicizing because I wanted to be the mayor. And I thought, no, I'm not politi politicizing this. And, and, it, and it was funny because I'm, I was listening to Anthony talk about the hospital and the, and the physician. And I was on that hospital board. I was on Hurley's board of managers at that time. And they called us in for an emergency board meeting. And when they called us in, you know, I'd had that press conference about two weeks prior. And they told us what had happened and, and, and the blood lead levels of the infants that had been tracked and what they were finding. And, you know, part of me was like, you know, you're relieved because you've been validated about what you went out on a limb to do. But it was, I didn't know whether to be happy or just to start crying because I knew physically, uh, cognitively, the impact that it was going to have on our kids, you know, those that had just been born, uh, mothers that had been breastfeeding and making formula, those kind, and using that water. It was just, it was a strange place to be because you're like, I, yeah, I knew I wasn't politicizing, but it's true. And you didn't want it to be. You didn't want it to be. And I must applaud you because knowing what you were going into, someone else might have decided, maybe this is not what I want to do right now. Maybe mm -hmm. I can run the next time, not mm -hmm. now. But you went right into it knowing the problems we are, you were going to have to face and solve. So... Shuffle, as we say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, because this is really... And what shocked me about the, the film is also that the situation in Flint doesn't seem to have changed that much. And that there is a terrible confusion among citizens and a terrible distrust for anybody actually now because it seems that those who were the bad guys now they're not there anymore those who were the good guys and the heroes they become the bad guys and the citizen don't know who to trust anymore to trust the scientists to trust the pseudo scientists to trust the politicians so the situ tell me uh karen please what is the situation now? The way well, you, you know live. what? Yeah, and it is. I, you know, I was listening when Anthony said, and I came back and I saw people still don't trust. And there's a good reason that people don't trust. And one is when trust has been broken on so many levels, you know, from local to state to federal government, uh, it is hard to trust uh, because these were the people that were supposed to be our voice and our protection. And then the voice comes in and is taken from us by the government. Uh, when it's covered up for 18 months and we're saying, brown water is not good and we've noticed differences with our children and with ourselves even and we're told it's good so then you, you know I get in office I declare I wanted to declare a disaster but because it was man-made I couldn't it could only be an emergency oh. and I was uh heavily uh pushed to not declare one mm -hmm. uh because I would make government 
angry. And I thought, we're angry with government, please. And, and so I declared it anyway. So we had to fight to get the money, even to change the pipes. We had to sue the state to get the money. The federal government did come off of $100 million, but they should have because they were part of the cover up. Uh, mm. So we sue, we get the money. We're doing the pipe replacement and it's going very well. And we were almost completed. Uh, as soon as I got out of office, it stopped. So the pipes were never completed, you know, changing those pipes. It was never completed. One of the things we talked about, if you want us to trust the water, I have new pipes in front of my home. The water is testing better, but people's in-home plumbing was destroyed. It was damaged as a result of that corrosive water. So your, your fixtures, where you turn your water on to get your tap water, your appliances, your plumbing was still damaged. And that's something that we said should have been taken care of by the government if you want us to trust it. I mean, it, it, it can be fixed but no one has stepped up to complete the project. And we keep hearing, we want, to, we want to prevent other Flints and we're all for preventing other Flints, but fix Flint and make Flint as whole as you possibly can. And when those things don't happen, people don't trust. And even the water, uh, you know, uh, people are donating some water to give, but you know, those lines, uh, they're, they're open for like three hours a day, uh, three days a week. And I think that's ridiculous that it's very ridiculous it should be based on people donating water, the government, the state, they should be doing right. something. And that was what they promised to do. And they didn't fulfill that promise. And so that's why people don't trust. That's why people don't believe. And uh, one more question to you. Why did you didn't I don't know the situation you didn't run again or they didn't reelect you? No, I didn't get, I ran again, I didn't get reelected. And I, and you know, I knew I was taking that chance because people wanted this water crisis to go away. Well, I do too, but I want it to go away the right way. Uh, and that is fixing Flint and doing what you said you were going to do. And I wasn't going to uh, back down about that. I was not going to stop talking about it. So that's what happened. Yeah, you were too uh, difficult. You were an that's obstacle. A Yes, yes. You were an and, and, I'm, and I'm still difficult. Yeah. yeah, I'm still difficult, but I sleep well at night uh, because <laughs> that was one of the things I said, you know what, if it means I'm not there, I can sleep because I know that I did everything I could do to elevate and expose what was going on in Flint because while Flint was done to us by those that were supposed to protect us, we knew that other places could use Flint as a voice and a platform uh, when they fought for access to clean water, when they talk about needing infrastructure, when they talk about environmental injustice issues. And so that's why it was so important for me to not stop talking about Flint. And that's why I'm so happy that, that actually, Anthony, that you were doing this documentary because people need to know, they need to know. Yeah. And Anthony, this document, uh, documentary is, uh, you said that it's going to show for the first time in Flint this weekend, right? Yes, that's right on Friday evening. So a lot of the residents will be there and people in the film, um, which will be very powerful. It's something we've wanted to do for a long time. We weren't able to do it because of the pandemic to begin with. And then we had to delay because the narrator, Alec Baldwin, that terrible incident last mm -hmm. October, and that again resulted in a delay. And so this will be the first time many in Flint have had an opportunity to see the film. And I think, who knows what it's going to be like, but I think it's going to be a really memorable evening for many ways, not least because as Karen was saying, th this is not over. This is an ongoing situation. The media may have moved on in many ways and goodness knows yeah, we have so much going on in the world at the moment uh, to, to take our attention. But it's really important, I think, that this story isn't forgotten and that the, the people of Flint aren't forgotten either, uh, because the news cycle is it's, it's so fickle. But the, the, the queues of traffic waiting for bottled water from churches continues every week. And I've seen that over the last few weeks I've been here in Flint. And also the residents in the film, who I spoke to very recently, all of them, none of them are drinking the water, even though 
The scientists will tell you that the water here is as safe as any other city in the United States. Mm -hmm. But the residents who have been through so much don't believe that. And who can blame them? Yeah. Is it true? That's well, we, we have to, we do, don't we? we have to listen to what scientists tell us, but we know from the recent COVID pandemic how scientific views can differ. And we're all having to make up our own minds about whether a mask is going to protect us or not, et cetera. You know, it, it's, it's so difficult uh, for people to wade through all this information. And that's what happened in Flint. So the people of Flint had not only the water disaster, then COVID, and the water crisis continues. And for many of people here, it's a case of having to make their own best judgment on information they're given. But it's really, really tough for people to do Very that. Uh, what do you think, <clears throat> as former mayor and uh, the one who started what the solution should have been, I believe, having read a lot of things about this, substituting the lead pipes, which is what is happening all over Europe. When there still are lead pipes, they're substituting them because now we know things that we didn't know when we used the lead pipes, okay? Uh, what do you think the new mayor should do? You know, one of the things I think is we should, the, the project should have been completed. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that one to me is a no brainer. Finish uh, changing the pipes. Uh, because one of the things we know is people need to actually see new pipes going into the ground. Uh, uh, so we do believe. One of the other things, and, and I was listening, as you were saying, we do have to listen to science, but we don't get to hear the science anymore. And that's a problem. We used to have meetings where we had the scientists, we had the physicians, we had uh, uh, you know, uh, the people from the state, we had those mm -hmm. agencies, that the oversight agencies, all at the table, but we live streamed it so people could hear mm. what was going on in real time. And all of that has been dismantled. So yeah. you can't well, listen to the science if you can't hear it. Absolutely. Why is and that? Was, and, and that's a very good question because that is one of the things that I asked. I said, I would really like to see this continue because yeah. people need to be able to have access to this information because that's how you can make an informed decision about yourself. But when it's uh, taken away, uh, you know, because I, I believe in, you know, I do believe science, but when you don't even hear people saying, mm. here's what we've done, when you're not putting results out, I mean, every Monday, mm. we were putting up results about the water testing and how many pipes had been changed and where we were with things and, mm. uh, you know, just educating the community and all of that went away as people wanted the water crisis to go away. And that's part, that that's a, a huge challenge. And I think those are just some of the things that need to be put in place. We haven't had anybody speaking up about the un, unfair, unjust water settlement that's come. We haven't had anybody, while charges have been made, no one has been held criminally accountable for this. And so when those things don't take place, and even if you can't make it happen, your elected official should be speaking up about it, because at least you know they have your back and they're fighting for you. But when that doesn't happen, it just builds that cloud of mistrust and makes it even bigger. And I think those things should be taken care of. And uh, I've also seen that the um, the settlements are really ridiculous that have been made for uh, the citizens, and some have not received anything at all. Mm. No, for what's going on. So no, you not have at all. highest. No, I was going to say, and that's a, a really bad thing. And when they do, most people will receive the most people will be lucky if they receive a thousand dollars. Oh my! Mm. This is terrible. This is so right. incredible that that can happen. So nothing has changed with this administration. With the change of administration, things have not moved a little bit more because I can understand that nothing moved before. <laughs> right. Right. Trump. And, and But you know what, if you don't have a mayor that is speaking up saying there's some unfinished business, uh, because somebody has to be carrying that message. And when you don't have people in place to carry that message, people do think everything is fine. And so that's why I said this story should never go away. Uh, and, and that's why 
you know, because of this, this documentary, I'm hoping it does bring some of that attention back. People right. are starting to listen again because, I mean, eight years mm -hmm. really, and the people still aren't drinking the water and the pipes have not been finished. It's inexcusable. The water pots have been shut down. I mean, it just makes no sense. Yeah. So, so that's what people need to know. They need to see what is what hasn't happened in Flint. And uh, that story needs to be told and it needs to be told by those that are elected as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Anthony, you are also uh, reported in the documentary that the recent sample group of 174 Flint children revealed 80% mm -hmm. required help yeah. for the language learning or intellectual disorder compared with 15% before. So yeah. you noticed that, you, you reported that, and you as a child psychologist, Karen, you must be appalled by I am, it. I am. And, and that was one of the things we argued about. I said, you know, we knew that our, our special education rates would go up. We knew our, the need for mental health services would, would, would go up. We knew that it was going to put an impact on the uh, negatively on the foster care and adoption system. The juvenile justice system would be impacted. And, and, and mm -hmm. that's just for starters. Those are just some of the things. And then when you have a second public health crisis on top of that, I mean, it, 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 I, I'm, I'm appalled. I'm angry. I'm disgusted. I'm disappointed. You know, and, and it goes back and forth, you know, watching the, the documentary, one minute you're angry, the next yeah. minute you're crying. It brings out all of those kinds of emotions. Um, so, it, yeah, it's a bad place to be. Uh, Anthony, mm. are you going to do Tribeca Film Festival? Are you uh, no, not with no. this film um because that's that's been but what we are doing is we're releasing it um it's released now in cinemas uh, uh, and we're, we've got a kickstarter campaign ongoing to try and bring it to more theaters yes. partly because in this world we're in um when films are in theaters they get more attention strangely yes. still and now people can actually go back to cinemas mm -hmm. and we can then get the newspapers and the media talking about the film we're then doing a digital release in the middle of this this month on itunes and amazon uh so people can see it there uh wow. and but yes we want to get as many people as possible to see it and, and hopefully as well an american broadcaster will mm. come on board and, and show it more widely so that the story isn't sidelined because i think for so long the the, the people of flint have, have been sidelined really um, and I mean, all listening to Karen and all of the really important points she was just making just now, you know, they don't get a platform. They need to. And that needs to continue. OK, this is. Uh, this is appalling, and I'm so glad that you got in touch with me for this interview, because this is exactly the reason why I'm doing this show. Mm. is to uncover all the uh, situations that have been lied about during mm. the history of this country mm. and especially in the african-american community because i live in harlem and i've been welcomed like a family i feel more home here than in italy so mm. <laughs> this mm. is amazing and I think that one of the reasons, and I heard you saying that in the, in the documentary also, Karen, one of the reasons why this could happen in Flint is that it's mainly black, black and mainly poor. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the attention wasn't there. Right. Tell me about this, Karen. Please. Yeah, and, and that was something that we knew from the beginning as well. We said this was about race and it was about class. And one of the things I always told people was Flint was not about water and infrastructure. Those were the symptoms of the underlying systemic yeah. racism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we knew it from the beginning, but it still took a year and a half for the Michigan Department of, of, of Civil Civil Rights I believe, to put this story, you know, to put that report together. It was like we had to wait for someone to tell us brown water mm -hmm. was bad. We had to wait for someone to document this in a report. And don't get me wrong, I'm very glad they did. Uh, mm -hmm. But we knew that this would not have happened mm -hmm 
had it not been about race and class. And if it had, it would have been fixed much yeah. sooner. The payment would have mm -hmm. been uh, would have been reflective of the value of our lives, the damage that has been done. And some of that is irre irreparable because people have died. Kids have been damaged. They will not reach, many of them will not reach their full potential. Uh, so we don't know what they would have been and where they would have been in life. Uh, they've, you know, their caregivers uh, have died or we've had adults that had compromised immune systems that have had all kinds of things. And some of it is we're still waiting to see the rest of the, the physical health fallout, the mental and emotional fallout is there. And you can see that uh, not just with the kids, but with adults that feel guilty for not being able to protect their child. I mean, I had a mother set crying because she used the water for formula and the guilt mm -hmm. that she and the father felt. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had women that had miscarriages and stillbirths. We had people that died from pneumonia, but it wasn't attributed to the water. And we know that's what it was about. Uh, and so, so you, talk, you talk also the about the the outbreak in uh, Legionnaire disease that was correct also. Exactly, exactly. And the number that they report is really lower it's lower than the actual numbers. But for so long, when you're told it's the water's good, that was not written down, you know, in those medical records is it was a result of the water. Mm. Yeah. I think we come to, at the end of this conversation, I wish we could go on forever, not forever, but for more. Mm. Right. Um, I am open to have some more uh, interviews about this later on when it's in the movies in the movie theaters and we can talk about the results and so on and we can maybe see something coming out because of this some results so we can talk about that yeah and uh, a last thing i would like to ask karen as a, an official if she could talk to the new mayor and uh, if she could talk to the Biden administration, especially the people in charge, what would you say to them? It's urgent to be done now. Uh, I would say make Flint whole, make Flint whole, fix Flint. People want us to stop talking about it. There's a way to get us to stop, fix it finish the pipes, uh, open up communication so people know what's going on. I think there should have been more money in that settlement and the EPA should have been part of that settlement. And, and, and I think I was offended because while they came to Flint to learn lessons so they could take it other places, I thought, wow, how dare you do that in the middle of a settlement where you wanna learn lessons from Flint to take to other places, but you don't wanna make Flint whole. And, um, and, and, and the government played a part in that and they should have a, an obligation a responsibility to complete the the fixing the damage that they helped cause so i'd ask them to please don't forget about flint i don't i, I want people to use flint uh as far as learning from flint but take care of the lives that were destroyed and damaged as a result yeah. of your silence and your cover-up that's what i tell them yeah. thank you karen and Anthony, what would you say as a journalist? Well, I mean, <clears throat> Karen's touched on all the, the, the main points, really. And I think as a journalist, I think it's just really crucial that the story continues to be reported on and the damage done to those children is documented as well so that they can receive the support and, and care ongoing that they need and <clears throat> the money needs to be there but it also has to be the case as well that that trust is rebuilt by the people in power and Cameron was talking earlier about how important it is to communicate mm -hmm. um, with people and that is really really crucial and it's the job of journalists in part to do that and so I think all of those things have to, to be ongoing. Thank you. Thank you for being with us and we see you next time for one more episode of My Harlem Portrait. Thank you. <laughs>